come today. My name is John Kurtz. I'm the Campus Outreach and Programs Officer for the National Review Institute. Um, we're very excited to be here in Florida, um, in DC and New York. It's rainy and cold and just unpleasant at the moment. So certainly happy to be escaping down here to Florida. Very happy to be in partnership with the James Madison Institute. They've been a huge help in putting on a five-stop tour for Charles Cook and his book to come down here. So we're very excited to be down here in partnership with those guys. I just want to take a brief second to introduce kind of National Review, the National Review Institute. Some of you guys may be familiar with National Review Magazine. It was founded in 1955 by William F. Buckley Jr. Um, it has kind of been the flagship conservative magazine uh, ever since then. It's the most widely read political opinion magazine in the country. We're very proud of that fact. Um, you may be less familiar with the Institute. It was founded also by Bill Buckley in 1991 with the purpose of complementing the work of the magazine and focusing really on the educational side to advance the principles that he was a champion of throughout his life. And about two years ago, we went through a reboot, and so we've kind of grown a bunch of different new programs, one of which is our NRI on campus program, which is why I'm here, uh, and very happy to be here. Uh, so essentially what our program does is we try to plan events like this with other partner organizations in the states, at universities across the campus. We try to get as many students involved with the National Review family, reading National Review magazine, and engage with our resources as possible. We try to work with a lot of student-led organizations to help them and provide events for them to really grow their base on campus and essentially help them do the work on the ground here at the local level. So we're very happy to be here. I'll stop talking and I'll turn it over to Becky from JMI. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Becky today and we came all the way from Tallahassee so we didn't come as far as these guys and Charlie and I like to call this the two accent tour because I have the southern <laughs> accent and he has the British accent so I don't think I have an accent. Do y'all think I have an accent? <laughs> You're right that's what Charlie says. <laughs> no, um, let me just tell you briefly about the James Madison Institute and first of all a shout out to um, Marshall DeRosa. Marshall such a pleasure to work with you always. Marshall, uh, we, JMI has worked with Marshall for many, many years and um, we appreciate all that you do um, here and for JMI. So thank you for helping us with this today. So the James Madison Institute is a public policy research organization or um, a think tank. And so we do research on public policy issues all from an economic standpoint. We don't do any particular um, social issues, but we do a lot of issues looking at them from a free market standpoint. So we're doing a lot of work these days um, on always on healthcare, always on education, <coughs> property taxes, we're doing some work in criminal justice, we're doing some work um, obviously on taxation issues. So what we do is we have um, experts around the country, we try to stay ahead of the curve and anticipate the policy issues that are facing the state of Florida we do the research on those issues and we make that research available to the, the decision makers, the governor, the cabinet, the members of the legislature. We're um, a nonprofit organization, we don't lobby, we're a research institute. And wh why we do what we do um, is that we hope that the people that are making policies uh, on behalf of all of us citizens of Florida, um, that they would use that research so that they make better public policy decisions that make it better for our families and for the people so um, if you're ever in Tallahassee, please come by and see us. Um, and before I introduce Charlie, I want to introduce um, my partner in crime back here, um, Mandy Keels. And um, we have several centers at JMI. One of them is the Center for American Ideals. And we do civics education initiatives out of that center. And also out of that center, we have our internship program. If any of you are ever interested in coming to Tallahassee first semester, we have a really vibrant internship program. And we also, just this year, have established a campus representative program. And we've identified 11 campuses around the state of Florida and have hired, yes, this is a paid position, um, campus representatives. And one of our campuses is right here at FAU. And Harry, who's at the back, what is Harry? Harry is our very first campus rep here at FAU. And I know he'd be more than happy to speak to you about the program. Um, and he's going to come up um, later and have a few words to say as well. But um, again, thank you so much for being here. If you have questions later about the James Madison Institute, any of us would be happy to speak with you. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Charles C.W. Cook, or Charlie. Um, he's a staff writer at National Review, a co-host of the Mad Dogs and Englishmen podcast, 
and the author of the Conservatarian Manifesto. Charles is a graduate of the University of Oxford, where he studied modern history and politics. His work is focused on Anglo-American history, British liberty, free speech, the Second Amendment, and American exceptionalism. In addition to his writing, Charles is a frequent guest on HBO's Real Time with Bill May, I can't say it, Bill Maher, okay, and Fox News um, Red Eye, and he's broadcast for the BBC, MSNBC, Fox News, and Fox Business. He immigrated to the United States in 2011 and lives in Connecticut with his wife and their dog, a black Labrador named Oakley. So, uh, Charlie, come on up and thank you so much. Lovely to be here. It's, it's not, I suppose, that it's cold and rainy up north and uh, warm and sunny here. It's just uh, warm and rainy here, which is a bit better. Um, what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about where I think uh, the United States is politically. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, my book and the, uh, the title, what it means, who conservatarians are, where they should be uh, fit in on the right. Um, then I want to talk about how I think we can fix the right's problems and many of the problems the country is facing. Uh, and finally, I want to critique, uh, critique my own position a little bit. Um, where are we? When Obama was re-elected in 2012, the press corps did what it always does, which is to presume that what was true at that point would be true forever. Uh, if you remember the headlines, if you remember the books that were published, it was the end of conservatism, it was the end of the Republican Party, they were set to go the way of the Whigs, uh, and Democrats would be ascendant with a younger, uh, more diverse coalition. Uh, this, of course, is precisely what the press said in... Uh, Oh, on the pack, sure. Up? Up, okay. There you go. Um, the same thing uh, has happened in 2004. When Bush was re-elected in 2004, we got the opposite book. It was the end of the Democratic Party. It was the end of American liberalism, progressivism. Uh, if Republicans were to lose, uh, we would have to see serious change. Democrats would have to become uh, a different party. And the future at that point seemed to lie in figures like Jim Webb, who just dropped out because he couldn't reach even 1% within the Democratic primary. Uh, the reason I mention this uh, is that politics is fluid, and uh, so uh, are world events. Uh, now, conservatism has taken a hit uh, since the 2000s. I think some of it deserved, some of it not so. Uh, what hasn't happened uh, is the realignment that was predicted within the media. When President Obama ran for election for the first time, he took something of a swipe at Bill Clinton. He said that Clinton had not been a transformational president in the way that Ronald Reagan had, uh, and that he hoped to be more like Reagan. And what he meant by that was not that he uh, wanted to move the country to the right, but that he wanted to change the average American's presumptions. Uh, he wanted to make it a, a reflexively progressive nation. Now, on that count, I think Obama has failed. I think conservatives should take some heart. That's not to say, of course, uh, that the country hasn't been changed. The legislation that was passed through in the first two years when Obama had uh, majorities in both houses uh, is uh, considerable. Uh, and subsequently, he's held on to those gains uh, and indeed made more gains through the use of executive action and just uh, sitting uh, in the White House and getting in the way, which is, of course, his constitutional right uh, of the Republicans' plans. But there hasn't been a realignment in the way that there was in the 1980s. And in fact, conservatives have done reasonably well at the other levels of government. It's tempting when we think about politics to look just at the White House because it's the most obvious, it's the most national, and it's uh, represented by one person. But when you hear somebody on television, which happens all the time, say Republicans can't win, Republicans are struggling to win, conservatives can't win, conservatism is struggling to win, what they're really saying is that twice in a row the Republican Party has lost the White House which is not particularly egregious historically. Indeed, uh, two-term presidencies now seem to be the norm. If you look at Congress, you have majorities in both houses uh, for the Republican Party. They run most of the states, uh, governorships and uh, state houses. Uh, and they have a slight balance on the Supreme Court, depending on how Anthony Kennedy feels when he wakes up in the morning. Now, this is uh, a repudiation of the idea that America has become 
a progressive place, albeit there have been uh, a number of serious reforms. So uh, when I hear conservatives talk as if all is lost, when I hear libertarians talk as if all is lost, I think they are overstating the case. The problem that they have is that while the Democratic Party has become more unpopular and while it has begun to lose at the state level uh, in Congress uh, and elsewhere, people don't like conservatives. They don't like Republicans. They've gone off the party. Now, I think there are two uh, major reasons for this. I think there are two major challenges facing the right. Uh, this brings me to the topic of my book, which is conservatarianism. Now, that is not a particularly pretty word. It's better than liberservative, which is the alternative. Um, uh, and I'm proud to say that I did not come up with it. Uh, others did. It seems to have developed organically, not in 2008 when President Obama won, but in around 2006, you started to see people on the right saying, I'm not a conservative, I'm not a Republican. What am I? Well, I'm a conservatarian. Or when I'm around conservatives, I feel libertarian. And when I'm around libertarians, I feel conservative. Uh, this has crescendoed. Uh, up until this point. And the two reasons uh, I think for that are, firstly, Republicans deserve a lot of the criticism that they got for how they did last time they were in power. If you look back to 2000 when they had uh, majorities, I think in all uh, three branches of government, or rather they controlled all three branches of government, they chose to do uh, a lot of things uh, that frankly alienated those who had voted for them. Now, I think some of the criticism that has been leveled at George W. Bush has been overstated. Uh, yes, he ran on the grounds that America needed a humble foreign policy. Yes, he ran against nation building. But 9-11 happened whether he liked it or not, whether we all liked it or not. And that does change a presidency. There was no choice but to react to that. That's not to say the invasion of Iraq was the right call, uh, but American foreign policy and his presidency had to change from that moment. I'm not sure it's fair. Uh, to blame him for running with it. Uh, where I think the blame is fair, however, uh, is on what they chose to do, what they chose to do in a vacuum. Uh, and in the early 2000s, the Republican Party writ large put its weight behind Medicare Part D, which was not the product of the Twin Towers coming down. It was not the product of the invasion of, of Afghanistan. Uh, and they put their weight behind No Child Left Behind. Uh, and they did so not because they especially believed in these programs, but because they wanted to buy voters. Uh, they thought that if you pass Medicare Part D, older Americans would become a Republican lock. At that point, they were leaning Democratic, and no child left behind was an attempt to win uh, suburban voters. Uh, it was bad policy. Uh, it was bad politics. Uh, and I think that those on the right who have moved away from the party or are now angry with the party uh, are justified in, in being so. The second reason people don't want to call themselves Republicans or they're calling themselves conservatarians uh, is because there is a generational divide on certain important questions. And if you talk to somebody on the right who is under 35, you can almost guarantee that they will be in favor of gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana. And if you talk to somebody who's over 35 on the right, you can almost guarantee that they'll be against them. Of course, there is some crossover. But generally speaking, uh, younger people are pro-gay marriage and pro-pot, uh, and older people are against those things. And that's going to cause a significant problem going forward, uh, especially for a party that doesn't have uh, too many votes to spare. What do we do then? What do we do? The way I think that Americans on the right should approach the problem that they have uh, is the same as the way I think Americans in general should approach the problems that we have. And that is to return to not a new idea, not a radical idea, but an older idea, an idea that, uh, in fact, is set up uh, in the country's constitution. And that is a more robust federal system. If you look at the United States now, it is more diverse. I don't mean uh, racially necessarily, although it is that too. I mean intellectually, geographically, philosophically, religiously. It is more diverse than it has been for a long time. So back in the 1960s, most people watched Walter Cronkite in the evening. They watched the same television shows. Everyone saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Uh, in fact, the president was, was complaining about this, I think, this morning, um, saying that it's very difficult now for an American commander-in-chief to get out a message because the country is so fractured. Um, he's right uh, in that complaint. Uh, the uh, fact that at the exact moment we have both been liberated by technology and we are seeing a much more intellectually diverse country 
the fact that at that moment we have started to centralize as much as possible, and at that moment we've started to elevate the majority of our policy disputes to the national level is, I think, bizarre, uh, and I think it's counterproductive. If you talk to a Baptist in Mississippi and then a hipster in Brooklyn, they have very, very little in common with one another. Um, they don't see the world uh, in the same way. Uh, and uh, instead of endorsing uh, a political system and a political culture that would acknowledge that it's okay for both of them to hold their worldviews and to try to create some latitude in which they can operate, um, we've come uh, to the belief that the best thing to do each and every election is to win and then impose our own conception of the good life uh, on the other. I think going forward, this is going to cause some serious problems. Uh, I think sometimes uh, conservatives can be a little too gloomy, talk, for example, of secession. But I do think, increasingly, uh, that this divided and this fractured country uh, is, is going to cause uh, political problems. Now, when we think about federalism traditionally, um, it's not uh, in the sense that we think about it today. You know, federalism is good for uh, acting as a laboratory of experimentation. That is a virtue, it, but it's a byproduct. Uh, it's a virtuous byproduct. Yes, it's much better to try out, say, pot legalization in Colorado rather than do it uh, nationally immediately. Find out what the problems are, find out what externalities cause, find out how the budget goes. Um, but that's not why the system is constructed the way it is. Uh, the system is constructed the way it is because when the Constitution was written, uh, it wasn't clear to the founders that all of these different people in these uh, different parts of what is a vast country could live together. And you had Puritans in the Northeast, Quakers in Pennsylvania, slave owners in the South. They didn't know that they could exist uh, peacefully uh, under one government. Now, I'm not suggesting we're quite as divided uh, as that, uh, but there is a good amount of give and take uh, available. And I think one of the things conservatives need to start doing, libertarians, and I would argue everybody, wherever they fall on the, the spectrum, uh, is to accept that uh, Texas is a good state, and so is Massachusetts. That we don't have to make Massachusetts into Texas or Texas into Massachusetts. That different people will want to live in different ways. Of course, within reason. Of course, under one constitution. Of course, under one civil rights act. But when it comes to transportation, energy, education, the building code, healthcare. There's no reason for these to be administered uh, from the center. And I think that the uh, tendency toward that uh, is going to hurt uh, America greatly. Now, the good news here is twofold. Uh, the first is that Americans in general uh, are coming around, uh, albeit slowly, to this position. If you polled people in 2003, 2004, and ask them whether they approved of the different levels of the federal government, you would find about a 55% approval rating for all levels, uh, federal, state, and local. Now you have uh, a serious demarcation line. Uh, federal is sitting at about 35% approval rating. Uh, the states uh, are sitting at about 55%, and local government is sitting at about 65%. And that's not just Republicans, that's everybody. That's Democrats, independents, uh, and Republicans. Now, who is, uh, who is liking the federal government at any given point depends largely on who is running it. But I think that underscores the point, uh, that having the uh, integrity of your institutions being contingent upon uh, the person who happens to be there at any given point is not good for a country. Uh, it's not good that if... Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or, God forbid, Donald Trump um, were to become president in 2016, many, many Americans, probably half of Americans, would be in a funk for the next four years. Uh, it's not good that uh, if Hillary Clinton wins in 2016, the right will continue to be in such a funk. There are, of course, uh, a number of roles, and I'll come on to this later, uh, for uh, a national government, but not everything. The second advantage uh, I see here is that the nationalization of everything has made us stupider. Uh, if you read the talk, Bill, he's very clear on this point. 
the virtue of, of localism, the virtue of federalism, it's not just that it puts you all closer to those who represent you. Uh, it's not just that uh, you are able to uh, petition uh, for redress of grievances uh, on your street or in your uh, capital city rather than on a city that is, for, for many people, 3,000 miles away. It's that it makes people better citizens. Uh, the reality is uh, that however smart you all are in this room, however smart I am, however smart anybody in this country is, they are never going to be able to master everything the federal government does. And the reality is that the vast majority of the things the federal government does don't affect you, which means if they screw it up, you don't notice. Mr. Tocqueville was clear on this. He said, look, uh, if you screw up your community, if you fail to fund education and streetlights, your children will be stupid and you'll bump into each other in the dark. You will notice. That's not the case when it comes to uh, federal regulation. You don't know, for example, uh, what uh, Washington is doing in terms of regulating logging. I imagine, unless there are any lumberjacks here or part-time lumberjacks. You don't know. And the only point at which you'll find out is when uh, there's no wood anymore. Uh, this is a big problem, and it's made us stupid. One third uh, of people in this country can name the three branches of government. Uh, that strikes me as uh, a bit of a problem uh, in a nation uh, which likes to elevate uh, policy disputes uh, to the national level. I want to uh, finish by critiquing my own position, because I think there are three obvious objections to it, and they're good objections. Um, the first one uh, is that there is no room for talk of local control, be it at the uh, city or county or state level. There's no room uh, for that to uh, be a proxy for a return to the pre-civil rights era. Uh, we should be clear this is a national priority uh, that uh, has had uh, disastrous uh, historical connotations. Uh, and to argue for local control of health care, to argue for local control of transportation and education and taxation and pretty much everything um, uh, that affects people outside of uh, the military is by no means uh, to permit violations of the Declaration or the Constitution. Uh, and that goes incidentally for civil rights beyond race. That goes for uh, the Bill of Rights as well. Massachusetts can't ban speech uh, in the name of, of localism. I think the second objection, and again it's a fair one, uh, is that uh, while competition between states, while uh, allowing some leeway for people who disagree to live in environments that they find more conducive to their happiness. Uh, while that is uh, a positive because it creates competition, uh, because it creates subsidiarity, uh, not everyone can up and leave. Uh, and especially if you're poor, especially if you're disadvantaged, if you have a bad state government, it's not going to be easy for you to leave for better clients. Now, many, many people do it. But not everyone's going to be able to do it. And that, of course, means that there's a role um, for national institutions. Um, the last objection uh, is that not all of these questions can be solved uh, locally. And that's absolutely right. Uh, they're still going to have to be serious and probably nation-dividing debates. Uh, the first will be on the question of immigration. You can't have 50 immigration policies if one state has open borders. All of the states have open borders. Uh, similarly, you can't have 50 foreign policies. You can't have Vermont uh, invading Iran uh, with the rest of the country uh, disputing it. Other than that, though, I think we are entering a period uh, in American history that is going to look more like 1915 uh, than 1960. Uh, I think we're entering a period uh, in which uh, people have a very, very strong local and individual conceptions uh, of what it means to be free, uh, of what it means to be happy. Um, and if we continue down the road uh, of allowing uh, Washington uh, to hand the majority of the spoils to the victor, uh, then we're going to see some, uh, some serious dissent. So I will uh, thank you for listening to me and uh, answer any questions you might have on anything political. I'll start off, but I encourage the students to also come up with some questions. But in your presentation, when you were naming uh, Republican candidates, you seem to 
this Trump? Is there any particular reason why, I think you said, God forbid, why Trump would be, in your opinion, such a disaster? Sure. Well, the first, the first point for me is that I don't think he's a conservative. And this is a guy who, in any other circumstances, would have been kicked out of the party. Uh, Mitt Romney was not the most conservative person in the world, but sometimes you got the impression that he was written off for having sneezed the wrong way. Uh, and Donald Trump can go on television and praise single payer in a Republican debate. Uh, he can suggest that the so-called assault weapons ban is not too much of a problem. Uh, he can praise eminent domain. In fact, he thinks eminent domain, the government taking a property to hand to private business owners, uh, is a wonderful thing, in his own words. Uh, and he seems to have become a Republican yesterday. Uh, and that bothers me. I don't trust the man. Uh, I don't see anything about him that is particularly conducive to liberty. He doesn't mention the word. He doesn't discuss ideas. The second point uh, is uh, I am probably more of a hawk on immigration than many, uh, despite being an immigrant. I think the existing polity in any country gets to decide who joins it. I think there are good ways of doing that, and there are bad ways of doing that. Uh, but I don't think calling people rapists, or suggesting that everybody from one part of the world uh, is, is a, a poor addition, or a poor potential addition to the United States, is what conservatism or libertarianism or conservatarianism or what you will uh, should be about. Um, and the third reason is I don't think he's serious. I, I think he is uh, entertaining himself, and I think he's tapped in possibly inadvertently to what is a very live issue. Uh, and the Republicans should not ignore that when he talks about immigration levels in general, uh, he resonates not just with conservatives or people on the right, but with people on the left. It is the case that both the Democratic and Republican Party are mostly led by people who disagree with the general public on the question of immigration. And that's true across the political uh, spectrum. Uh, but I think as a, uh, as a candidate for, for the leader uh, of the country, I think it would be disastrous. How do you explain the Democratic Party's nominee, presumptive nominee being Hillary, her negatives were really kind of off the chart as a traditional candidate, and yet the Republicans are getting absolutely little of any traction um, in the polls. How do you explain that? Well, I think that in a sense we're discussing there two different questions. The first question is in a vacuum. Do you like Hillary Clinton? The second question is do you want Hillary Clinton to be president? Or this other person. Uh, and when, when I hear that she has 42% approval rating, um, a small part of my heart that leaves is quickly tempered by uh, the other part that recognizes uh, that when it comes down to issues, people will, will side with uh, the vessel who agrees with them. Now, I do think it matters that she's disliked in the middle, and I think occasionally American elections are decided by who's more likable who seems uh, more competent. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, Republicans uh, are not only still, I think, mistrusted, especially in the White House, because of what they did. And that goes for the right and the left. One of the reasons Republican approval ratings writ large are lower than Democrats is that Republicans also say they hate the party. Um, but either way, uh, and many of them might stay at home, uh, that they don't necessarily come from. Um, so you know, I, I, think those, I think those are two separate issues. Uh, if the Republicans can uh, find a candidate that is acceptable to most, not all, of the party, if they can find somebody who is, is likable and uh, charismatic, um, and Hillary's approval rating stay where they are, then they'll have a shot. Uh, but let's not pretend that the moment it comes down to a debate over guns, or abortion, or Obama's health, foreign policy that we're not going to line up in the same camps as we usually do, even if she's uh, the nominee. Is there a conservatarian candidate in your opinion? I don't think that there is. Uh, I, I think that there are some candidates that have those instincts. Um, Rand Paul on drugs and criminal justice reform, I think, is uh, impressive, although I'm nervous about him on foreign policy. I think he's naive. Uh, I also think Incidentally, that Rand Paul on foreign policy is something of a, a shapeshifter uh, and has therefore managed to alienate both sides in that he uh, 
was supposed to be more of my interventionist, but then he gave a speech when he announced his candidacy and he said, well, we need to put boots on the ground against ISIS and increase military spending, at which point the hawk said, well, I'll go for the genuine hawk, and the non-interventionist said, well, that's not my guy. So I think he's done himself some harm there. Um, although I have, uh, and I, I understand conservatives are sometimes irritated with me about this, although I have a, a, a real disliking of Ted Cruz, um, as a person, and I think his behavior is often reprehensible. Um, he does have some conservatarian instincts. For example, he increasingly wants to get the federal government out uh, of parts of the drug war. Um, he does believe in federalism. Um, he does have a, a more libertarian view when it comes to spending. But the reason I tend not to lead my talk by discussing candidates is that I don't think this change is going to come from the top. Firstly, I think it's going to take a very, very, very long time, maybe 20, 30 years. Secondly, I think it's going to come when people stand up and say that they don't want those in Washington uh, doing this or that. Now, a great example for this recently has actually come from the left. Uh, in Colorado, in Washington, and in Oregon, they, they legalized weed, and they did so at the state level. That's led to uh, a criticism of at least one part of federal power. Uh, it is not popular among those who pushed those uh, initiatives through, that if Loretta Lynch woke up on the other side of the bed tomorrow and decided, hey, I'm going to go into those states and enforce federal law, that their work would have been, or would be, uh, undermined immediately. Uh, and if you look at elections now in those states, this is a real issue. In the same way, for example, Medicaid expansion is a big issue on the Republican side. Uh, excuse me, I think John Casey is going to really struggle do you think they set the precedent by doing that with gay marriage? Did they open the floodgates? Do you mean the, the Supreme Court decision? So marriage has always been a state issue. Right. And did they, did they break a precedent when they made it a national issue? Well, so I'm in the odd uh, position of being in favor of gay marriage but thinking that the Supreme Court's decision was, was nonsense. Sorry, it wasn't um, I mean, I, I don't just think it was wrong. I think if you read it, it's, it's nonsense from start to finish, it, it is, uh, it's, it's legal um, fluff. Um, whether it sets a precedent in terms of federalism, I, I doubt. Uh, what I think it does do is it sets a horrible precedent in terms of substantive due process. We're probably going down too much into the weeds here. Uh, but you know, one of the things that it did was at least partially overturn a case called Glucksburg, which had limited the court's capacity to make these decisions on these grounds. And Kennedy blew that over. But I think that's more worrying. But in terms of federalism, that, that's not so much what worries me. Uh, no. <clears throat> One basic problem with the solution of federal, federalism is, of course, that politics is hard to regulate. It tends to move to the arena where you have a chance to win. Right. So, so uh, conservatives uh, help the Supreme Court and it decides upon gay marriage, but it wants it to decide upon Obamacare uh, and override Congress. Uh, and you will always have that, that when you when you have the majority in the House of Representatives, you want the House of Representatives to be the one deciding everything. Right. And uh, and that's hard to avoid. Right. That's part of politics. But I've, I've been quite worried about the lack of understanding of the Constitution among conservatives constantly talking about the Constitution. I, I mean. Uh, this tendency on some on the right to be so critical that they have not immediately been able to force through everything sure. just because they have a majority in one of the in one half of one of the branches, right. uh, and and it creates some problem if they don't understand that the constitution is constructed in order to have a lot of friction. Sure. Uh, and created that you have to win several elections to conquer all branches. Uh, and uh, that you have to compromise and alliances have to be formed. There seems to be very little of understanding of the reality of constitutional democracy in the Republic of America. Right. Uh, the institute you're describing is, of course, why I shy away from saying, well, I think this candidate will save us, or even this senator or this representative will save us, because they won't. Uh, politicians don't give up power, and indeed, when they get there, they often ignore the constitutional strictures that they appeal to when they're <coughs> running. Uh, I don't think that uh, salvation, therefore, is coming uh, from the top. I don't think it's coming from winning the sort of arguments that we have uh, in the 
press, I think is going to come when enough people have something that matters enough to them that they want to be able to run their state as they wish. And I see signs of that beginning uh, to happen. Uh, you hear so many saying now that it, we just throw out all, all, the, all the people being there now and having some right. outsiders, ignoring that it's not just the people as such, it's, it's the institution, the way the institution structures. I don't understand that. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's why I say it'll take 20, 30 years. You've got to reform administrative law, you've got to give Congress a backbone. Um, this is going to only happen though if people want to. Now, I could be, you know, 30 years' time, I'd be completely wrong. Um, it's, it's entirely possible, but I see that coming from the bottom up. I would just say one thing on your Supreme Court point. Um, there are some people who just want the court to do what they want, and so they like it uh, when it comes to uh, gay marriage, but they don't like it when it was uh, Obamacare, or rather they were, they were unhappy with the decision. But I, I would point out that there are legitimate and illegitimate uses of the court, and there are legitimate and illegitimate interpretations of the Constitution. So some of those critiques are fair. In other words, that the progenitor is saying, look, this was not a decision based upon the Constitution's text, and that was. Um, I think you can make a strong criticism of uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, and his majority opinion in, in Spalia's case, uh, and a strong criticism of uh, Obergefell gay marriage decision without being contradictory. I mean, for example, uh, if the Supreme Court said tomorrow that the First Amendment guarantees the freedom of the press, and then the next day it says that four-year term actually means five-year term, I mean, it wouldn't be unreasonable for the same person to say one was all right, the other wasn't. No, but it was probably additional constraint from uh, Roberts, even if he had used strange arguments. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we can probably do this all day, because now, now what we'll do is we'll, we'll get into the, the correct role of, uh, of a court and a republic. But I think even from an originalist perspective, the, the Contradiction you just discussed, described is not one. You mentioned we have a tendency to elevate things to a national stage. Now, is that more of a lessening of the Tenth Amendment, all rights not ceded, um, given explicitly stated for the federal government, ceded to states? So, is that a decrease in awareness of that, or use of that, or is that just political expediency on part of the politicians or the people behind? whatever policy that lost at a state level, wishing to bring it to a national level. You did mention that one-third of Americans can name all three branches of the government. So it wouldn't be far-fetched to see that you can manipulate the general public to get whatever you want. So I think a lot of it is, is education and culture, especially when it's so easy to see what's happening in the White House. Um, and we, we probably now know more about what's happening in you know, a state 3,000 miles away than what's happening down the end of our, our road. Uh, most of us find things we're interested in, uh, whatever that might be, and we focus on them, and we can do that. Uh, the internet has been a, a godsend in that way. Um, the downside of it is that you might not know what's happening in your community, um, and therefore you might not care, and so you conduct your debate through the radio. Do I agree with this national politician, or do I agree with that national I think the second reason is an understandable one, and that is that the, the, the tragedy of American history is race. Uh, the you know, people, gun nuts such as myself, occasionally say, well, what, what if it were to happen here? Right? It being tyranny. But it did happen here. Uh, we, 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 we had a tyranny in the South. Uh, not just slavery, Jim Crow as well. Um, and part of that was reinforced um, by a, a belief in federalism. Now look, federalism is a neutral thing. Uh, it's an entirely neutral idea. And so, for that matter, um, is secession. But in America, both have been used for pretty ugly causes. Uh, and I think that because of that, you've seen a, a tendency to shy away uh, from local control. If there is even the slightest hint or suspicion that it will be used uh, for ill. Now, one of the things I try to do in the book is point out that, of course, you can use it for ill, and there's a federal role in stopping that. Uh, but we have overly broadened what it means uh, to, to use uh, local control for ill, to the extent that now you hear people complaining about Houston's lack of zoning, as if it's some pressing national question for people in Portland, Oregon, and it's not. 
Um, so I think the combination of those two things um, is a big is a big part of it. Um, but you know, as I, as, as I say, if you go back to the 60s, you had a good reason maybe to expand federal power. Well, not maybe you did. Um, now I think you have a good reason to diminish federal power and to um, to allow this big and increasingly intellectually diverse country to, to live uh, more harmony with itself. Um, so, big times change. You mentioned that some policies have to be pursued at a federal level. You mentioned immigration and foreign policy, which are at least bilateral and only some other state. Right. I was wondering if there were any policies that were domestic that fit into this category, in your opinion. Sure. I mean, look, firstly, there are things that each state can do that are going to cause externalities that affect another state or another person. Now, the obvious example of this is the environment. That's not to say the EPA is, is not out of control. I think it is. But the, the legitimate, uh, the rationale for its existence is legitimate. I mean, if you are burning coal on the border of California, um, it's, going to, it's going to leave uh, the state. It doesn't care what the line is. Uh, and that goes for many, many problems that we have in the US. And that's why the federal government was created in some part. That's why the interstate commerce clause is in there. Uh, unfortunately, we've done two things. Firstly, we have an asymmetrical conception of what is acceptable and what is not in terms of those externalities. So for example, I'm very much in favor uh, of Colorado uh, having undergone its marijuana experiment. I think marijuana being illegal is worse than it's being legal. That's, that legal. That's not to say uh, that I don't think there would be big problems with uh, a country in which you could buy drugs in every store. Um, uh, but I think that the current set of problems that we've created uh, are worse. But you know, Colorado is impinging on Nebraska. If you read the reports, especially around the border, uh, the police uh, are spending more money uh, fighting those who are bust driving, those who are smuggling uh, uh, contraband into that state. And just crime in general seems to have gone up a little bit on that border. Now, I would say, all right, fine, that's the price of federalism. Okay. Um, and generally speaking, progressives would agree with me. But when the question is guns, they think that if a single stolen gun goes over that border, then it's a federal issue. So I think we have, a, we have an odd way of discussing this. We have a self-serving <coughs> way of um, discussing this. And the second problem is that we've redefined what interstate commerce means. You know, yeah, of course, if you have a a power plant on the side of one state, it can go into the other. That's probably interstate commerce. Sure, uh, if you're shipping goods across the country uh, and so on. But you know, now under both the Wickard decision in 1942 and the Rafe decision, we have redefined it to the extent that if somebody acting entirely within one state happens in any tiny way to affect the overall market, it's interstate commerce and the federal government can get involved. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, that essentially gives the government police power. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of, of, of questions. Transportation, you're going to have interstate transportation. Trains, airplanes should be regulated federally. Um, but uh, what subsidies um, Alaska gives to the town of Sitka, which is pretty much isolated from everywhere else, is simply not the, the business uh, of the federal government. And I, it's that line that we need to draw more. Ask another question. I'm just curious. So you, it's fair to assume you're a conservatarian. Yeah, right? very much. Could you, uh, you know, for the students, and also I'm interested in uh, knowing your position on the Federal Reserve and the rationale behind that position. Okay, so I'm going to do something that I rarely do, which is to say I don't know enough about this to give you an answer. Um, I'm not going to, to waste your time um, pretending. Uh, I'm not an economist. This is an issue I haven't thought about enough, so I, I just have to um, talk about something I do know. I think that's, well, uh, can I kind of probe a little bit? Sure, sure. Uh, because you're making a case for decentralization right. and a more robust federalism. And the states have been co opted through the federal national government's fiscal policy. Right. And most of that is funded through the Federal Reserve, the fiat money. So if you really want to uh, sort of cut the legs off of the feds, the federal government, the national government, and centralization, one way is to cut off the funds. Um, 
So that's what I was getting at. So it's one, in other words, the states are being co-opted, sometimes against their will, but if 25, 30% of their budget is coming sure. from intergovernmental transfers, oh, okay. that, okay, that's sorry. my point. Just, just to clarify, so it, would, you, would you level the same objection at, at any central bank? I mean, if we go back to the debate of the, the early, of the early republic, where Madison not only thought that a central bank was, was a bad idea, for some of the reasons you've just adumbrated, but, but also that it was unconstitutional. Um, or is this a specific objection? This would be a Jeffersonian position. Right, okay, that's fine. There is, just to clarify, I don't know enough about economics to, to get into the argument about the Federal Reserve per se. But yes, the, the central bank issue, well, okay, so to me, the much, much bigger problem that we have here is not that there is a Federal Reserve or that there is a national bank. It's that through a combination of uh, an exploded conception of federal power, and the 16th Amendment, the federal government has been given essentially a set of police powers, or at least a much stronger a set of coercive powers. A good example of this uh, is as regards to the drinking age. So the drinking age is 21 nationally. But it's not that there's a law that says it's 21 nationally, because that would be unconstitutional, or almost, uh, almost certainly unconstitutional. Um, the federal government tied it to highway funding in the 1980s, uh, and said, you're not getting this money unless you do what we want. Now, yes, that's not the same thing as passing a law or enforcing it at the point of a bayonet, but it has expanded the role, which I think is your critique. And my view uh, is that if you want to get rid or you want to diminish um, that power, you have, to do, well, you have to do two or three things. Firstly, you have to change the conception of the Commerce Clause, which is going to be almost impossible, but probably easier uh, in the long term than getting rid of a national bank, given that this has been a, uh, a, a debate for, what, 230 years? And the, 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 the argument over the bank fell on the side of the bank far earlier than the argument over the Commerce Clause fell to the side of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and the second thing uh, you're going to have to do is limit how much money the federal government can take in. Because uh, if, it's, if it's hauling in uh, the majority or close to the majority of, of tax revenues in the United States, then it's going to be able to tell states that would otherwise be taking that money for themselves, hey, unless you do this, that, and the other, um, then we're going to tell you what to do. And so to me, it's the combination of a 16th Amendment that gave the federal government a great uh, amount of money and the explosion of what constituted commerce has led to this. Uh, as regards the Federal Reserve, opposed to the banks that existed before, as I say, I'm, I'm not uh, qualified to talk about that, but I don't think for the purpose of your question it, it matters. Good, thank you. Good answer. This is a really different topic, but I know that you were recently about the open carry bill that's going through the Florida legislature. Um, there's also a bill going through the legislature for campus carry. That would allow campus carry. I'm just wondering what your opinion is. So my view on campus, well, okay, the first thing I'll say on this is that whatever you do with gun laws makes pretty much no difference at all. So I think the NRA is wrong when it says the, the more you know, liberal, in my sense of the word, the, the freer the gun laws, the lower the crime. I think that's true. I see no studies that back that up. And I also think that critics are completely wrong when they say that, that the more you loosen laws, especially carry laws, uh, the, the, the more murders there are. It's just, it's just not correct. And in fact, although I'm not establishing causation, as I've just said, um, we've seen over the last 20 years about 100 million new guns sold in the United States. Um, and uh, we've seen the vast majority of the laws uh, either repealed or watered down. Uh, and we've seen a reduction in uh, both the gun crime rate of 50%, which is extraordinary, it was 4% again last year. Uh, and we've seen uh, a reduction in crime in general. In fact, uh, violent crime in America is now as low as it was when John F. Kennedy was inaugurated. The vast majority of people, uh, statistics show, don't know that. Um, the reason I mention that is that when we have these arguments over campus carry, uh, they really tend to boil down to statistics that are completely meaningless. Uh, in that the NRA will say, well, if, if we have campus carry, then it will stop anyone from ever being hurt. Um, and the critics say, well, people will be shooting each other in the classrooms like this if they get a bad grade. Um, and it's just not going to happen. I mean, it never happened. Uh, this is what they said in 1987 when Florida debated the uh, Constitution, uh, the, uh, concealed carry law for the first time. They said there'll be shootouts in the supermarket, there'll be blood on the floor of public, Disney World will be drenched uh, in spinal fluid, and it just never happened because human beings don't behave like that. And we now have 50 states that have what Florida did, 
uh, and it hasn't happened. In fact, we have seven or eight states that have got rid of their laws here completely, uh, among them Vermont and Maine. So, in terms of the way we argue it, I think we have silly conversations. What do I think about it in general? Um, my view is that if you are given a permit to carry, it should be good pretty much everywhere. Um, now, that doesn't of course include private property, which would be up to the property owner, but this is not private property, this is a state university. Uh, and as such, I think the state should follow um, the state rules, which in Florida are that uh, you can still carry. Um, I don't think it will make anyone safer or less so, um, but really that doesn't matter to me because it's an individual right, and I don't understand why we have to justify the individual right when it comes to the Second Amendment, but not when it comes to the First. Nobody would ever say, well, you don't look like you're going to win that argument tomorrow, Charlie, so you can't speak. Look, it's possible that we would not survive if a school shooter came in. It's possible that we would not survive uh, if somebody came into our houses. You have a right to try. That's why uh, that right, which is an auxiliary right based on the Lockean principle of self-ownership, that's why it exists. So I'm for that right, and I'm for it being applied broadly. I don't want to force anyone who doesn't want to carry a gun to carry one. I think the NRA flirts with that. Um, and uh, I don't want to pretend that it's going to solve all our problems, because it's not. Okay, one more question, and that's it. All right, you mentioned earlier how we need to, well, you said it'll take 20, 30 years for it to actually happen for us to try to trim the power of the federal government back to uh, a more federalist type of uh, level. Now, you said it wouldn't come from the top, but it would be more like from the bottom. So is this talking like a coalition of states forming uh, statutes, amendments, movement, whatever? Or is this going to come down to the individual citizenship, like a, a special interest group forming and then spreading? So I think in some areas it will be the former. Uh, I've been an advocate of an amendment to the Constitution that will essentially overturn the Kelo decision. Uh, just for those who don't know, the Kelo decision uh, was, I think, ruled in, in 2005 and held that the takings clause within the Fifth Amendment allows the federal government uh, and indeed the state governments to take property against the will of the owner, providing they're justified, it, uh, they're, they're, sorry, providing they're reimbursed, justly reimbursed. Um, and to do so not just on the grounds of public use, which is what the Fifth Amendment says, uh, but to do so on the grounds essentially of public benefit. The specific ruling said that if more tax revenues come from what the person who takes the land does with it than, with, than was previously forthcoming, that's public benefit, therefore. Now, I think that's an absolute disaster, and you would expect me to as a libertarian and a conservative, but what's interesting about it is so does the NAACP, and so does the AARP, and so does the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and so the vast majority of the people in this country. Uh, there is an, a, an alliance here, I think a great alliance, between libertarians who say, you know what, uh, you should not be able from Washington to take my house in order to give it to Donald Trump. And I don't say that lightly because he's terrible at this. He does it all the time. He tried to evict a 91-year-old from the house so he could build a casino parking lot. Um, you aren't able to do that. Uh, and you have the NAACP saying, you know who's going to get kicked out, right? It's poor people. The poor people are disproportionately black and brown. So, you know, I, I've been an advocate of this because I think there's an obvious alliance there. I think it's probably one of the only potential constitutional amendments that can pass. So some of it will be like that. But I more look at it um, in terms of uh, communities who have made decisions collectively pushing back against federal power and therefore taking a first step. It didn't happen in 2005 with the race decision on uh, marijuana. Uh, that case, uh, you had uh, California has a medical marijuana program, and uh, an individual who I think was suffering from cancer was growing medical marijuana on her own property uh, in order to uh, alleviate her pain. The federal government said this, this law uh, is against our national law, and therefore we can raid you. It came down to the Commerce Clause because that's how they justified. Now, the, the most infuriating thing was that the progressive groups that had fought for the medical marijuana law and uh, sided with her morally and politically refused to sign the amicus brief to the court because they were worried that if the government was limited in that sense, then it would be limited in another sense. That's a, that's a big problem, right? That's a big problem that we face. But if you look now, especially with the three states, Colorado, Washington, and Oregon, 
that position is beginning to fall apart. That, that unity behind the progressive project from those who are invested in this. Now, I can't tell you what the other upcoming fights are going to be, because everyone has something particular that's, that's interesting or um, important to them. Um, but I think when you look at, um, when you look at the way people uh, fight for gun rights, um, speech rights, uh, I think there's going to be a host of these uh, these issues, and I, and I can see some pushback uh, at the state level. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much.